if you're wanting to make a difference, if you're wanting to do good things, you, you need to be the one to get out and, and do that, especially if you kind of create a mission or a message that you have to share. I mean, nobody's going to do that for you. You, you got to do, you know, do yourself. I've been in service, it'll be 20 years in July, and any amount of time you spend in the fire service, you're going to have some ups and downs. I don't know many people that have been fired up from day one to the last day of 30 years, you know. They get tired of answering the why. Maybe it's because they never really knew the why, because they weren't taught the why. They were told what to do, and they did it. If you don't know why you're doing something, and you got somebody that's wanting to learn from you, it's going to be hard to want to do that anymore. And Comfort is safety, you know. It, it feels good to be comfortable. It feels good to to know what you're good at or know what you can do and not ever do anything else. I think the biggest mindset change that, that you have to really incorporate in yourself is just be humble enough to understand that there are a lot of people out there that know a lot more than I do. And I want to learn from them. I want to get better at a skill that I'm not really great in. If, if I want to do that, then that probably means I'm going to go fail at it quite a bit. You have to embrace the fact that growth requires failure. Why are you here? And I vividly remember every one of us saying, well, to help people. It's, it's got to be deeper. It's got to be more than that. Helping people goes away. It will vanish and you will be left as a empty, jaded, burned out firefighter with nothing else, else to give. You don't have something deeper than just helping people. To make a difference in the lives of of my crew members, in the lives of my family, in the lives of those outside of my organization in the fire service. I'm here to grow and learn every day. I want to become better. I want to have a pursuit of personal growth every day. And I want that to not only be at work, but I want it to echo at home as well to make the fire service better. You know, we've already talked about a few situations in the fire service. They need to be better. They need to change. That's what I want so bad. You know, you got the senior man or senior firefighter or whatever. I almost hate that term. All it implies is you've been there longer than a lot of other people. That can mean you've been sitting on your butt 10 years longer than anybody else. You know, senior firefighter isn't an out. It's a verb. You have to get out and do something to earn that title. You have to really apply yourself to help others grow and learn from what you have learned and the mistakes you have made so that hopefully they don't have to make them. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. My guest today is Jeremy Sanders from Crew First Culture. Crew First Culture are based in Oklahoma, USA, and they teach courses on leadership as well as running a podcast of their own and trying to develop an underground movement for the American Fire Department. Before we jump in there with Jeremy, I just want to acknowledge our partners of the podcast, and most importantly, William Wood Watches, who are joining us again for today's episode. William Wood Watches have actually been with the podcast since the very beginning. If you're unfamiliar with who they are by now, then where the hell have you been? William Wood Watches are the number one creators of these beautiful luxury timepieces made with recycled fire service equipment. Whether this is the brass helmet embedded in the side of the watch, or whether it's the hose that actually features as the strap on your wrist, there is authenticity and history in every aspect of this watch. The owner, Johnny, came up with the whole brand in memory of his grandfather who was William Wood himself. He served for decades in the British UK Fire and Rescue Service winning medals for his bravery. These watches allow you to carry a piece of history right there on your wrist. Even looking at like the straps they've served a minimum of 10 years operationally on the front line. This stuff's actually been there with the heroes doing the business and you can take a look at them by heading over to williamwoodwatches.com and you may even be able to crow by yourself a bit of a discount if you drop us an email the firefighterspodcast at gmail.com. We may be able to sort you out. We can have a little word with you and see what we can do. So if you are sitting comfortably, let's buckle up for safety and I will see you crazy cats on the other side. Okay, I think that's good. <laughs> you smiling, yeah. brother. You good? I sound pretty okay for you. You sound fantastic. You sound better than me. But that's, okay. I think that's the accent. So, you know, don't, don't, don't blow smoke <laughs> You're right. ass, but, Mate, seriously, I don't know what right. it is. I think of the other day, I was like, man, I'm going to get on there and people that are around him listening to him or some hillbilly hick <laughs> person with a <laughs> cowboy accent or something. So It comes with an air of authenticity. People assume you've done like 150 years in the fire service. Even when you, just, you just say <laughs> yeah. anything remotely to do with the fire department. Perfect. Right. I'm ready, man. Jeremy Sanders, welcome to the Firefighters Podcast. How you doing, brother? 
I'm awesome, man. I'm quite a quite an honor. So thank you. Man, that's a lie. I'm not believing that. <laughs> no, no, and I do appreciate it. We, yeah. <laughs> we don't um, we don't do much of this sort of stuff in the UK, so it is kind of strange and, and unique. You know what? I know it's not something we uh, necessarily plan to talk about, but what is it about sort of the American fire department, the American fire services that you guys just seem so much more proud and so you're like it's like you bathe in the passion and the the kind of like you celebrate each other, you acknowledge each other. You seem to be so much deeper in the culture. Why is that? I mean, it's it's all about how sort of crew first culture has got started. It's, it seems yeah. so so dripping in passion. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I I understand what you're saying, I, and it, it's hard for both of us. You know, we don't have a lot of context on the other side. Yeah, just kind of what you maybe see through still photos or whatever. But uh, but for us, just the honesty part, I will say that it's it's not everywhere. I mean, it it, it might be one of those kind of you're seeing the highlights. So there's a lot of American fire service that are, that are checked out and, and just kind of jaded and, and not in it. But I think that the people that are just love it, just love the job, just are thankful and blessed to have the opportunity to, to be a part of this job and this, this service. It's, it's an amazing chance to, to really, you know, to enjoy what you're doing, to, to make a difference in people's lives and, and to grow and get better every day with, with not only your friends and, and new family at, at work, but hopefully learn things to transition into creating a better person when you come back home too. And it, it's an amazing career. What other career can you look in a podcast and see dozens of career related podcasts, social media pages and training companies? And it's just, it's just crazy how into the job so many people are. And I don't know the answer to that. I'm just, I'm glad that it's like that. No, man. I, and I totally agree with you. And I, and I think there's a strange thing that um, it depends how you want to start and which like direction people want to go in when they, when they start their careers. Because like you say, some people hit the valleys and stuff like that. I mean, I know we spoke about something we're going to speak about coming through about finding the real why. You did a, you did a great thing about that. I'll ask you about it in a little bit. But it's kind of like the chicken and egg about for me when people, if they lean into the job a little bit harder, then it almost gives you a greater sense of fulfillment, doesn't it? But like you say, when people start to check out, they take less from it. And therefore, they become more disinterested in it. And therefore, they take this out. Oh, yeah. and then that becomes like a negative self-perpetuating loop. But the same can happen in reverse. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If you just lean in, people start to gravitate towards you. And depending, you know, you kind of have to go first, though, don't you? Yeah, I, I think that that's the way it should be. You know, if, if you're wanting to make a difference, if you're wanting to do good things, you, you need to be the one to get out and, and do that, especially if you kind of create a mission or a message that you have to share. I mean, nobody's going to do that for you. You got to do you know, do yourself. Yeah. But one thing I'll, I will say, like for me, you know, like anybody else, I, I feel like it's probably across the board. I've been in the service. It'll be 20 years in July. And any amount of time you spend in the fire service, you're going to have some ups and downs. I don't know many people that have been fired up from day one to the last day of 30 years, you know, so you're going to have some, some downtimes too. And, and for me, now that I'm kind of back up on a, a, a high point, I have so much more fun. I enjoy the job so much more. I enjoy life so much more when I'm into it, when I am really reaching and, and striving for, you know, a pursuit of daily growth and, and trying to get better at different tasks and, and skills and things like that. I just, I just enjoy the job so much more. And now that I've kind of got out of the slump, that last slump that I was in, it's really easy for me to see. And it's, it's a cool thing to see. And, and it kind of helps keep you going because I don't, I don't want to get down in that low valleys anymore and, and really not enjoy what I'm doing. I want to stay on top and enjoy it. I mean, you've written so many amazing things on the blog and people you've had contribute to the page from your own learnings and observations and, and I wanted to start with this whole sort of concept of um, creating your foundation. You spoke about this trend that you've seen these sort of great fire service, great fire department leaders are, are leaving the fire service and they're taking all of those valuable lessons and experience that they've gained over the years yeah. of careers without really sharing them. And I think there's kind of two sides to that coin about some people don't feel like they've 
deserve the, to share it and then some people are kind of hoarding the information but when you became a station officer you said that there were areas that you had no choice but just to learn as you went now so why do you think that that trend was happening when you wrote about that creating your foundation man i, I honestly that's just, that's a that's a great question i wish i knew the answer i'm trying to find the answer to that and and it's not a a my department thing you know the more i get out and network us the uh the pond or whatever you want to call it, it it's everywhere you know we're we're, ha- we're struggling to share experiences and and knowledge that that we've gained through entire careers before leaving and we're struggling to develop officers before they step in that role and we're struggling to properly mentor you know the, the new firefighters coming on and I, I don't i don't know why i don't know why it is i i feel like almost some of it is just we're losing a little bit of teaching spirit to us we're we're kind of falling back on well. If you have a training division in your department, that's your that's their job to train us, and yeah. and it just it it doesn't happen. You know, if we don't get out and do it ourselves, it, it's it's not going to happen to the full p- potential or the full area that that we need to. And, and I, I don't know. I I think maybe part of that is you know you hear it a lot. You know, why are you always asking why? You know these. These newer people, they always want to know why they don't just do the job. Well, I think maybe that's your answer right there is these kind of middle road people, the older people, they they get tired of answering the why. Maybe it's because they never really knew the why because they weren't taught the why. They yeah. were told what to do and they did it and they didn't really have a why. So if if you don't know why you're doing something and you've got somebody that's wanting to learn from you, but you don't know how to answer their questions. It's going to be hard to want to do that anymore. And I don't know. I mean, maybe that has something to it, but I remember reading about, um, I I think it was like Einstein or somebody said, you you never fully understand something until you can explain it to a child. And the the reason I think that's relevant to what we're talking about is some people, and I think this might be a generational thing. I'm, I'm listening to you there and I'm hearing what's changed, what's changed, what's changed. And I'm thinking to myself, this whole instant gratification society that we live in now where things come fast, you know, come, I remember, you know, I, I wanted to be in the fire service since I was very, very young and I was doing the whole cadets thing and I would go down and see the fire department and I would read the books and my dad was a, we had this thing called Scouts and Cubs and I think you kind of have it over there, but they're like, yeah. it's like a kid's club that you go to and you like learn campfires and you learn knot tying and all that sort of stuff. So I was, I kind of oh, yeah. I had a little bit of an introduction to that sort of stuff, but I knew it was going to take a long time for me to develop into that. Whereas now we're into this whole instant gratification thing. And I'm, and I don't, I don't know if I think I'm fishing here, but I wonder if that's adding to the level of people never truly understanding why they wanted to get into it because then when it tries when it comes to the point where you try and disseminate that when you try to speak about it to people coming into the job now when we would struggle to articulate but also like we're in an age now like when we're doing podcasts we we came from an age where we read the books and then we kind of moved into a period of time where we had presentations and stuff like that and we need to fully embrace things like this like what we're doing now we're not well i, I can only speak for myself i'm not an expert you know what i mean but i, I always say yeah I, I try i try and speak to people that are and i try and capture it because yeah. i feel like this is the new way of developing people this is the new way of capturing that information the capturing the stories i joined the fire service and the fire department because i fell in love with the stories you know i heard about the person yeah. or I, I looked at the badge and it meant something to me because of this image that i had created in my head but then I wonder if people got a bit too proud and a bit too cool for school and we stopped talking about it because we're like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm too cool for that. You know, I don't want to talk about it. I'm, you know, and people got a little bit like that. And then it had yeah. the effect of people were never going to capture those lessons. They weren't going to capture the stories. We, we stopped, we stopped talking about it. We stopped feeling in love with it a little bit. Does, does that relate at all? Oh yeah. And I think, I think there's no one answer to this question. I think it's a problem big enough that it's not going to be solved by one one answer you know you, i think there are lots of different things that go into this i think there's lots of different reasons for that you know just uh, you know, some older people getting checked out getting jaded getting tired of of being involved in things and just basically collecting a paycheck or you know it's kind of people that are have been put under officers that weren't the greatest to be around and they kind of get you know, a bad attitude about it and, and want to just be done. And, and there's there's just so many things that go into it. I, How soon do you think people can start passing on that knowledge? How soon should we encourage people to start trying to lead or mentor each other? I feel like, you know, we 
at, at my department, we we've got a rookie school, so they get they get hired. They go through this rookie school that's you know anywhere from twenty two to twenty six weeks, somewhere around there. And so, you know, when they graduate from that, they come straight on shift. And I was lucky enough this past rookie school to get a new person on my crew. And I, I, I did it then, and I'm going to do it every every chance from now on because I knew we have a great environment for a new person to come on. I knew we had some great people to to mentor and train new firefighters. And so I, I wanted to make sure that, that we were in a position that, that we could do that. So uh, otherwise it's just kind of random. So, but day one for me, I, I a hundred percent agree with what you just said. And that's exactly why they, they have just spent, you know, basically what, five months, six months yeah. going through skill after skill, after skill, after skill, way more training than, than we do. And so hopefully they have something that they can teach us. And, and even, even if it's just some, some refresher stuff, mm. they are getting a taste of what it feels like to start that route right off the bat to, yeah. to start kind of teaching, to start, you know, sharing what knowledge they have right out of the gate. And I think that is so important to, to really put that on their plate right away. And no, I'm not, you know, putting them in charge of creating huge classes or, you know, curriculum or anything like that. But just, just take out, take us out for an hour today and Mm. let's, let's do some post stuff. What, Mm. what did, how did they teach you guys to move, maneuver around with hoes? Just like do those micro sessions where they just stand and deliver. Oh yeah. Just standing in front of people and building that confidence and just speaking. Even if like, sometimes I'll give uh, the recruit the sheet. So we we take a sheet out on parade, which tells people where the runners and riders are and who's riding what appliance and stuff like that. I'll get them to just stand there and read it out. Not in like a embarrassing them way, but just that act of stand and deliver because they're going to have to do it in face of the public anyway. People always say like, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a leader on our crew. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you are. You know, if you're a firefighter, you're you're a leader, you're a leader in general. You're going to step off the truck you're going to step off the pump straight into the eyes of the public and yeah we i might be dealing with the incident but i'm going to point at you and go go and sort that crowd out i need everybody off the highway i need everybody i need everybody out of that building and you need to step up and lead you might be leading the public you might be leading a a casualty you might be leading a crew in in an internal structure i need you to lead so getting people to just step up and do that plus i would kind of think as well when you get a recruit it's like a way to sneak in the back door of um, some (laughs) of the older people on the fire on the on the crew and get them to run the fundamentals because it sometimes it's harder not difficult but it's harder to get them to do it when they're like we know we know this stuff and i'm like "Mm, you kind of know it but i would like you to run it anyway but then when you say oh we're going to do it for the benefit of the recruit we've got to do some recruit training and then you kind of you see a few of the cracks that you didn't have an opportunity to go over before. You know, I think this right here, what we're talking about is it's, it's my kind of my way of maybe trying to fix that first question. You know, if I am getting these people to get used to teaching and, and sharing what they know right off the bat, they start their career and, and enter into kind of the, the middle meat of their career, just doing it. That's just how it is. And so Hopefully, maybe over time, that will kind of cure some of that if, if we start them off young. Yeah. Now, I love an article. I was looking through your blog before we came on, um, and I read one that effectively spoke about this sort of subconscious conditioning. That's kind of like um, you know, kind of groupthink that occurs when people confine themselves to a single station or a district or a department because you know it's comfortable and it's familiar for them. So uh, what do you think? people are scared of or reluctant of to, to go and beyond those current surroundings and how can you prepare yourself mentally for moving outside of that comfort zone? Do you think there's benefits in moving watches? Is it, is it common in the States for people to move stations or move crews? And, and do you think they should be doing that? For us, we went through a, a pretty lengthy time of, man, it seemed like there was constantly movement. Now, the past couple of years, it seems like it's been pretty stable and so, you know, you just never know when that's going to shift. So it, it, it could be pretty, pretty regular changes or it could be, you know, you're with somebody for a few years. And I, I think there's, I think there's a benefit to both. I, I've always loved the idea of being with a group of people for a pretty good amount of time, just because you start to learn 
each other's strengths, each other, each other's weaknesses. You kind of get to know the personalities. You get close to them, and you get close to their families, hopefully. And you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said about spending a lot of time with a particular crew, you know, with, as, as a group. But these past couple of years as an officer and, and kind of going through some growth and, and learning some lessons that I needed to learn, I've, I've definitely learned there's positives to the other side too, because if I just stay with a particular group of people, my message and, and, and the things that I'm trying to do, the culture I'm trying to change, it, it doesn't ever go anywhere. Yeah. We might have a yeah. great crew, but that doesn't ever go anywhere else in the department. And and I'm not going to really ever affect any kind of global change, even at, at my department. Level. My, uh, my circle is going to be very small. And, and if I don't kind of disperse some of the, you know, some of the people that I've tried to teach and tried to show how fun it can be, it, it won't really ever do any good to, to make it bigger than just uh, our group. So, yeah. you know, there's benefit to both. I, I think as far as why people have a hard time getting out of the comfort zone, I, man, comfort is safety. You know, it, <laughs> it feels good to be comfortable. It feels good to, to know what you're good at or know what you can do and not ever do anything else. Yeah. And, and what goes along with that is a fear of failure. And so I think the biggest mindset change that, that you have to, to, really incorporating yourself is just be humble enough to understand that there are a lot of people out there that know a lot more than I do. And I want to learn from them. I want to, I want to get better at a skill that I'm not really great in. If, if I want to do that, then that probably means I'm going to go fail at it quite a bit until I do get better. And so you have to embrace the fact that growth requires failure. And, you know, there's a lot of humility in that. And, and I think that's the biggest obstacle we have to overcome is just getting used to it's okay to fail. It's okay to mess up because you're not going to get any better if you don't try for sure. And you're not going to get any better if you don't go through some failures here and there. You make some great points there around um like you say, learning from from different people as well, because uh, I was I was with the same team for, for a couple of years and then. As I would sort of have, con- and this is kind of where the podcast came through really, you know, as I started having conversations with different people from different departments and different places in the UK, and I thought, you know, there's some absolutely incredible people out there that just because the communities they work in or the, the kind of uh, layout of the, the patch that their station covers, they're going to have experiences that I'm never going to have. And how egotistical it was of me to think that the, you know, the best people <laughs> were on the watch of the station that I'm, I'm working on. These these people are everywhere, and you're never going to be able to layer those experiences if you don't get it. And it doesn't mean that you don't like where you are either. You know, if you want to move and oh, develop yeah. yourself, it's not because you hate where you are. I say to people, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking to move in a, in a year or two, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you're not getting on very well. You're not very happy. I'm like, yeah, yeah I love it. I love where I am. But I also, you know, that, yeah. that, that station does water rescue, or that station does technical rescue, or they're specialists in, in, in high rise. And I'm like, I, I want to go there. You know, I want to have, yep. I want to have those rope rescue skills. I want to have that development. And th- there's also a thing, you know, and you, you kind of mentioned it there, but this, uh, I used to do something in my old, uh, my old business that we did an exercise called sunshine and shadows. Right. And this, this sounds like really corny and everything like that. You can probably come up with, <laughs> you can come up with a better name for it. Right. But it was called sunshine and shadows. And, um, it would be like, we'd sit in a group. It wasn't like group therapy, but it was that like feedback and we'd sit somebody yep. in the middle. So for example, we'd have like, Say you were sat in the middle. We said, Jeremy, you, you sit in the middle. We're going to do yours. And um, first we do the sunshine, which is we tell you something that is one of your greatest strengths. So we'd say, Jeremy, man, you, you're so passionate. You're so articulate. And you you just go into such depth about you know the service and the department and all your skill set. And I, and I think that's such an incredible skill of yours. That's the sunshine. And you are right, great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. The shadow. The shadow is, man, because you appear to be so knowledgeable and because you're so articulate, it makes me feel uncomfortable about sharing my opinion because I can't put my words together as well as you can. And 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 the similar thing, like if you've got somebody that's really confident, you're like, you know, yeah. Dave, whatever, man, when you when you jump off the truck, you're just on it. Like you drill hard and you're so strong or you're so fit or you just you've got so much experience. It's a real strength. But yeah. the shadow, the shadow that that casts over somebody else is that they they'll they're never gonna grow that area of them if somebody else is doing it so well. Does that make sense? So if they don't move crew, oh, yeah. they don't move stations, yeah. it, it, it makes the team really slick, 
but also they yep. never develop that skill. Yeah, exactly. Yep. We often speak on the podcast, and you kind of said it at the beginning about you know why people join the job, um, and that that common response is always, "Oh, because I want to help people," or "Because I want to make a difference." But I, I mean, I found in the sort of ten years in in one in one department and thirteen years in in sort of a whole time service that it, the why is a real big thing that 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 people need to have a real think about. I mean, you mentioned it at the beginning of it, and you know, this is kind of a mid-range income position. People don't necessarily come into this just for the money. And there's a lot of personal sacrifice required, not just by you, but, you know, your family, your friends, your loved ones. And in your opinion, what what do people need to find to not allow it to consume them? How do they find that that sort of why that you've spoken about before? Does it need to be more than just wanting to make a difference? Because it's not going to carry it through, is it? No, absolutely not. And I, you know, I reached out to you yesterday because I was really kind of, I don't know, I, I was, kind of taken back when I, you know, saw that question that you were kind of wanting to talk about, because like I said, with you, I mean, I literally just finished up a class that I've been excited to, to really get, get in the books. And, and that's exactly what it is. It's it's called, why are you here? And it's kind of tailored to, you know, the newer firefighters. And, and I feel like this is something that really needs to be done is, and so I'm glad to to have it done. And, and when I saw that question, I was like, that's that's going to be fun to talk about that because you obviously kind of share some same thoughts as well. But for me, why are you here? And I just think back to when I was new. And that was literally something that a lot of people ask you. And I vividly remember every one of us saying, well, to help people. You know, I, I don't know if that's because that's kind of the canned answer that's, that's easy to say, or for me, you know, and it's taken me 19 years to figure this out. So this isn't going to be something that, you know, you just take a 30 minute kind of just a deep thought and figure it out, but it's, it's gotta be deeper. It's gotta be more than that because you go, you know, five, 10 years of, of these, you know, going and lifting people up, put them in bed, going and, you know, dealing with, medical calls that aren't really medical calls in the middle of the night, waking up, you know, three, four times. And yeah. it, it helping people goes away. It will vanish and you will be left as a empty, jaded, burned out firefighter with nothing else, else to give. And that will happen very quickly if you don't have something deeper than just helping people. And so I'm here to make a difference. I'm, I'm here to, to make a difference in the lives of my crew members, in the lives of, you know, my family, in the lives of those outside of my organization in the fire service. I'm, I'm, I'm here to make a difference in the lives of our citizens. Number two is, is I'm here to grow and learn every day. I want to become better. I want to have a pursuit of personal growth every day. And I want that to not only be at work, but I want it to echo at home as well. And the last one is to, to make the fire service better. I want, I want so bad to see, you know, we've already talked about a few situations in the fire service that they need to be better. They need to change. And that's, that's what I want so bad is I see these areas that we can be better in and we should be better in. And I want to do everything I can to make them better. And, you know, it's just three things, but those three things, keep me going. Those three things help me when, you know, I haven't had a fire in forever and all I'm doing is, is lifting people up and putting them in bed. And man, it's hard to keep going when you go through stretches like that. I, it's, it's tough. And so you have to really zoom out and think that that person that you're going to see, you are like, if it's just for you, like, oh, I'm just going to help people. Like you say, that runs out. But for, for that one individual, you, you are the story they're going to tell. So when they go, you know, they go, hey, you know, I, I called the fire department out once. And who was that guy? You know, was it? Jeremy. You know, this guy Jeremy came out, right? And he did X, Y, Z, or he did ABC. And before he turned up, it was tragedy. And then, then he came and the team did X, Y, Z, and it became this. You will be their story. You might be their entire life's interaction with the fire department. And you will be the, the, the story that they tell. And like, and like you said as well, we're just custodians of this. This was here long before we were, and it's going to be here long after, you know, and we, are you going to leave it in a better place th- than what you found it? People often say to me, you know, when, when I'm doing the podcast and it's, it's people that I've probably known before I was ever doing it. And they're like, Oh, you know what, Pete, 
people and these are the pessimists you know and there's not there's not many of them you know we get some incredible feedback from the podcast but you always get the people that yeah. want to throw stones and at the end of the day then they're, oh, yeah. they're not the people that want to do it anyway but they always <laughs> say stuff like you know oh, you, Pete, you'll be remembered for oh, doing all the stuff in the community and flapping your gums and you know talking talking about this and talking about that and i said yeah yeah you know you, you, you you're probably right i said do, do you know what they'll probably remember you for and i said what nothing they won't remember you for anything. And are you going to make a difference? Are you going to leave it yeah. better than you found it? All of these things. And every time you have a setback, the pessimist is stood there and they're ready to go, oh man, you know what, ram this. You know, let's, let's just forget it. You know, they don't, they, don't, they don't know what you've got and they don't want to listen to you and all oh, the, the jobs ruined, you know, the jobs out. And I'm like, man, I can't, I can't engage with that. It just it doesn't fit yeah. my moral compass. I can't go there with you because there's no way for me to navigate back from there. You know, and I, and I see what it does to you. I don't see anybody enjoying being part of the thing that, 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 that they spoke so highly about for so long when they're choosing to see all the negatives. They hunt them out like like it's a little yeah. nugget, like they want to get reward for it. And it's hard for them to see people enjoying the job sometimes. And there is still so many incredible people. But that's why, you know, people like yourself and whatever, you've, you've got to put it out there. You've got to kind of get over yourself. And I know you have, but I, I know we're not alone in this. There's so many other people because they want to re-engage in that that why, why I did it. And know yeah. that they're not alone because when they are sat on a crew one day and they've got somebody covering from a different station and they don't want to be here and maybe they're six months away from retirement and they feel alone, you know, they feel like, man, is this is this what it's like everywhere? You know, is, uh, is everybody not enjoying it? And you're like, no, you know, we're still pushing forward. There's still so many things for us to solve in the community just because we're not doing the same jobs that we used to go to. It's about creating that that culture. You know, I mean, you speak a lot about culture in your classes. Yeah. And in my experience, you know, unlike equipment changes or rules or policies or, or even actual personnel adapting to it, it's changing or developing a culture can take a lot longer for organizations to do. I think, yeah. like, if you read books and stuff, it takes, like, five or six years to change a culture because you have to be so consistent with it. And you almost have to share a message to an extent where you're sick of hearing it. If you're sick of hearing it, it's probably about the time that it's going to start, it's going to start sinking in. How do, yeah. how do you think we create those cultures? Man, you, you said it right there. Yeah, just that consistency. And to be honest, that is something that I struggle with no matter where I'm at. I struggle with at work. I struggle with at home as a parent, as a, a, a husband. Consistency is hard for me. And I don't know if that's just a, an ADHD thing or just my personality or what, but that's, man, that has been a struggle. And, and like you said, it's slow. If, if you're come if, if you're expecting to make big changes and, and drastically, you know, make something better quickly, you're, you're going to be very heartbroken because it's, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I've been, I've been the captain at, at my station now, which is basically the, the station, I don't know, the boss leader, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I've been at my station for three years and I, I'll tell you right now that I'm just starting to see some of the, the good come out of a lot of work. And, and I will be the first to admit that I could have been a lot more consistent through that time. And maybe, maybe that timeline would have sped up if I could, but man, it's, it's hard. It's hard to stay at it every day and just, just keep pushing and and something for me especially now you know i'm still new in the officer role and and kind of this whole thing you know, i'm kind of learning it on the fly but you know i've got this mission and and i know what i want our crew to look like and, I, and our culture to look like well if that's the case if this is me if this is my vision well i'm i have to be the one pushing it i can't just throw it out there on the table and say hey Hey everybody, this is this is the way we're going to do it. So let's go, and I'm going to hold you accountable from day one on pushing this because this is what we want. Well, it's not really what we want. It's yeah. it's mainly what I want. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm kind of going through a gross gross stage right now where I feel like I'm kind of I've done it long enough, and I feel confident enough in what my mission and vision look like that I'm ready to start asking you know, my crew members kind of how they feel like we can make it better and, and, and hopefully get a little bit more buy-in from them because they are a part of that. And, and maybe that will help kind of that whole process because I haven't really done a lot of that. I've, I've asked them, you know, what they need from me as their officer and, 
and how to make things better. But I've never truly put it on their plate of saying, you know what I like, you know what I want our culture to be like. How can we make it a little bit different to where you take some ownership of it and responsibility for it so that I'm not just pushing this you know, ball by myself. And so that's kind of something that I really actually, to be honest, plan on dropping just in the next week or so with my crew right. and, and really digging into. So I want to double click on a few things that you've said there, because yeah. one is that aspect of like, like you say, pushing a boulder uphill is the way I see it sometimes where you, oh, yeah. you start it, but if it is just you pushing it, you're, it's not it's not leadership at all. And I did this for so long where you're actually, all you're is, is an individual contributor. You're just a nucleus that you plug it into the system and you just power it. It just brings a massive surge in it, but it's not, it's not sustainable. It's not consistent. And no, you, you, no. it will kill you. You know, it will, every time you come back and you realize you, when you hand it over to them and they placed their hands on the boulder and you went off your shift or you went off whatever, and you came back and found it at the bottom of the hill and you just got bitter and stamped your feet and, and you dug in and then just pushed yep. harder and pushed harder because you don't take, but you've got to slow down to bring people with you. Haven't you? I always think of it like, uh, like when you watch a space film or something like that, when they go, you come in too hot and you just bounce off the atmosphere or a little bit like <laughs> you've got to yep. slow the train down for people to get on. And that's not to say that like they're, they're slower or faster than you. But what I mean is if you come in too hot, it's like arriving on station in the morning. You know, I, I do a lot of stuff in the morning. I'll like, I'll, I'll listen to an audio book on the way in and then I'll, I'll train before we start shift in case we get calls. I don't get a chance to train. So when I come in, I come in hot. Do you know what I mean? I come in ready and you've got to stop yourself stepping in and like, high-fiving somebody and saying oh man how we how are we going to smash it today and they're looking at you and they've literally just got in there on time rolled out of bed and they're looking at you with that <laughs> blank face and they're like dude don't don't come here with your high five give me, okay i'm give me about an hour <laughs> <laughs> give me about an hour and like if you come into you almost have to and you know it's not like being two-faced it's not you're not lying to people but you have yeah. to come in slower no, yeah. come in colder yeah it's the whole like warming up a you know the frog in the frying pan thing. If you come in too hot, they just jump straight out. You've got to slow yep. down and yep. bring them with you. you. You said about sort of asking your crews how to bring them on. There's um there's four great questions. I always tend to I used to um, do a role called continuous improvement, which is like a CI technician. It's about Kaizen. If you ever seen, you ever read a book called Kaizen? I have not, but my driver and good friend that would consider him one of my biggest mentors. He. He talks about that all the time. Oh, so man. I have heard Kaizen. it through him. Yes. Kaizen, Six Sigma, uh, Consensus Improvement. Have a look. There's a book called Kaizen. It's good. Have a read of it. Um, and okay. th there's four questions that I go into sometimes with teams. It kind of disarms people. And instead of saying, you know, what's right here, what's wrong here, and all this sort of stuff, it's just four simple questions about what do we want to keep doing? What do we want to stop doing? What do I want to do more of and what do I want to do less of? It doesn't frame anything as being right or wrong, but it just frames them of, good, what do I want to do a bit more of? What do I want to do less of? What do I want to start doing? What do I want to stop doing? And, and there's lots of different ways to do it, but it's a nice little box method. And then you can come up with like a like an effort reward matrix where you can get the low hanging fruit and you're like, if you did it in like a pictorial sense on a board, it's, um, you know, you have effort and uh, effort and reward, effort down the side, reward across the bottom is what stuff is low effort, high reward? You know, if we said, oh, we, yeah. need, we need to build a new fire station because this place is shit, you'd be like, okay, but that's massive effort. It's massive financial investment. It might also be massive reward, but it's at the top right yeah. of this graph. We are going to struggle to hit that. What's low effort, maximum reward? And we don't just want that, but let's start with the low hanging fruit because there's some things which are small pivots. These are tweaks. They're not colossal right angles that we've got to like you know pull a hard left and everyone's going to fly out the side door you know what what can we do that is just a pivot you wrote a great article as well when i was when i was looking at stuff about blame and responsibility and it's something to try and like you said drastically avoid especially if you're coming onto a new station and i love the how you sort of flipped the narrative inside of it of you know people that blame the youth and the millennials for this like poor work ethic when people are coming into the job now and you wrote something that was really quite like stark when i read it and i think you quote it in the middle of the article as where it says our senior firefighters have got to get out of their recliners off their phones and regain their passion for the job that is going to be an uncomfortable read for some <laughs> people when they look at it but you're yeah. right and i often say you know we can't we can't mm -hmm. just look at the past and go oh it's a waste of time or you know this is rubbish you know if it was crap before we got here 
then that's fine. But if it's if it's rubbish while we're here, or if it's rubbish in the future, that's our responsibility now. Share your thoughts on that for me, because I thought it was a great read. And when I read that statement, I was like, wow, that's that's strong. But it hit me like a train. Man, I, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, some of the, uh, I, I'm, I was about to say some of the stuff I write, pretty much everything I write, I don't write a lot, but if, if it comes out, especially if it's something you can feel like that, then it's, man, it's coming from inside me and it's, it's got something behind it because it's something I have either lived through or experienced or am currently experiencing and, and really have something to, to say about it. And, and that's exactly where that, that kind of came from is personal experience and kind of frustration. And we've got some great, great senior people in our department and, you know, that have had a lot of good experience and should be taking our department to a whole new level and just really blowing the roof off of things. But to be honest, a lot of these people just, they're not gone. They're not there. They're checked out. They're just, they're sitting in seats and, and, and just kind of collecting a paycheck like we talked about. And man, it's, it's hard. The the higher I go up, you know, uh, if you are in charge of a whole crew, you will quickly understand how important it is to have some informal leadership because they will make your job either way easier if you got them or way harder if you don't because you've got to have the big hopefully those in- those characters are so oh, yeah. powerful in a team you've got and to know just who are the big taking ones. care of the things that i don't really have to take care of you know behind the scenes and and you know being more of an inspiration to my people some of the times instead of me being all the time you know there's so many things and and really kind of the main thought behind that and it might be kind of corny i don't know but for me, senior, I hate the term senior firefighter. I just, for the American fire service, we, you know, you got the senior man or senior firefighter or whatever, but I almost hate that term because it literally implies nothing. All it implies is you've been there longer than a lot of other people. Mm. That, that could mean you've been sitting on your butt for, you know, 10 years longer than anybody else. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But for me, that's not a noun. You know, senior firefighter isn't an out. It's a verb. You have to get out and do something to earn that title for me. You have to, to really apply yourself to, to help others grow and learn from what you have learned and grown and, and the mistakes you have made so that hopefully they don't have to make them. And, and as you can see, you know, I started getting worked up just talking about it. That's one of the things that we have got to get better at in the fire service. And, and I, I don't know, it is, would you say that, that you're kind of seeing a little bit of the same thing where you're uh, at or is it just uh, yeah, an American thing? You're absolutely right. I, I see that all of the time. And it's so challenging to not allow people to correlate time with experience and feeling like they've made it and that they've gained competence or that they've gained position of, of like success. Like people, I sometimes ask people, what's a successful firefighter? And I kind of hate the question sometimes because it it – it almost frames it as though you've achieved a thing and now you can stop. Yeah. Whereas what it oh, yeah. is, is a con- like you say, it's a verb. It's not a now. It's a continual process. It's in the doing. It's almost like getting into the middle of the river and starting swimming. And you see, the, the real analogy is what does it take to be somebody that can continually swim in the middle of the river and adapt to everything that comes downstream and pivot and overcome and improvise and be that master problem solver? You don't. If you get there and think, I've made it and do nothing, you drown, and that's that's what you see. You see yeah. so you see a lot of people sitting back because they got into the middle of the river at one point in time, but they've stayed there doing nothing. They've started drowning, and then when they do, you know, go into a job or you know, you do get a, a, a series of, of incidents where they're really tested and they crumble, and then you have a whole different thing on, on their hands where they become disengaged because they feel like they're so behind the curve, and then like the the upcoming firefighters or the upcoming crew members don't look at them as a position of respect anymore because they've seen that their actual their skill set isn't there or their fundamentals aren't there and the experience stood for nothing and and then you're in a really dangerous place where you can fracture the very concept or the very vision that that person had coming into the service because they had this idea of these you know people that were hungry and these people that were getting after it and they were curious to get out there and get their hands on the kit and you know check the lockers and the energy was there in the morning and, and if and if that's not there we hemorrhage so much we lose the culture we lose the feeling we lose that that desire for continuous improvement so it really has got to be 
a consistent process. It's not a an end point that that you achieve. I don't I don't see myself coming to an end with anything. That's not because I'm going to keep getting better forever and ever, but I'm going to keep learning forever and ever because yeah. life life continues to change. You know, technology, um, incidents, you know, materials that are buildings are, are made of now. The way that the community is struggling, and the, 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 we fix one problem, and all of another, all of a sudden another one occurs, and and mental health, and there's so many things. There's no such thing as standing still. Everything else is moving forwards. No. If you think you're standing yeah. still, everything else, you're actually going backwards. You know, people pull over yeah. on the highway of their career and they stop. And you kind of, you kind of, you know, you're passing by and you're like, dude, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, well, you've stopped. You know, I thought if you broke down, are you, are you, str- are you injured? And they're like, no, I'm just, I'm just stopping. There is no stopping. All right. Comfortable. I, 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 yeah. And that, that's it. It's, it's so hard to watch. What are some of the things that we're saying but w- that we're not doing in terms of where where do you think the fire department is heading over there? What do we want to be aiming towards versus what is actually the reality versus how it feels on station? There's there's two that jump out really quickly, and one of them is is one of those areas where you're like you got to be careful what you say because you don't want to say too much. But but the other one just first for me is is for them. I don't know if, if you all have kind of that saying there, but so for them, basically when most people say it, it's, it's what we do every day to prepare ourselves for the job is for them. You know, we want to be ready when somebody needs us. Well, for me, just kind of as a side note, that for them extends out a lot farther. It, my for them includes my crew. My for them includes my family and my for them includes my citizens. So it's bigger than that. But, you know, that's a big thing right now in America is the for them. I feel like there is a lot more said than actually kind of done for that. I feel like especially kind of you get up into the the administrative roles that for them kind of gets blurred because, you know, you have a house that has a lot of fire and it's scary and you don't want to send anybody in, even though that fire is really only in one area of the house. And there's a whole nother area of the house that has bedrooms that we can be doing something to search and, and, and look for people. But, you know, we see too much fire and, and we, we're not going to go in there. And, and that's just a very kind of on the kind of surface mm. kind of idea. We're so scared about somebody saying, you put the crew in there and they you know somebody died somebody injured themselves the safest thing to do people think is nothing but that comes at a tremendous cost as well oh yeah absolutely uh, you know you will never be safer than when you are truly competently trained on whatever particular area you're talking about you know it, mm. that is the that is honestly the really only way get to a point where i can say i am safer now than i was you know a month ago because i trained enough in that area that I know what I'm doing. I'm competent in that skill. I can do it safer now than I could back then. And that's, that's how I wish we approach safety. You know, we approach safety by becoming more trained, better trained and more competent in those areas instead of just kind of writing policies to get safer. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that for sure. I always, um, when I think about some of the stuff I do with my children, and I'm not sure I'm getting the words right when I say this, because I keep saying this to myself, and I don't think it comes off right. But I always say to the parents, I'm like, do you, do you want your kids to be safe or do you want them to be strong? And some people, it bounces straight off them because I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm community. I try and think that I'm good by my words sometimes, but I don't think it comes off right. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say to people is like, I encourage my kids to go and go and speak to people. And I encourage them to, you know, eat something that's fallen on the floor two minutes ago and, you know, not, not, you know, not live in this clinical world. You know, they don't go diving through yeah. bins looking for food or anything like that. You know, I feed my kids, but you know, <laughs> the, I don't, I don't encourage them to never scrape their knees or fall off their bikes or, you know, I always say shy kids don't get sweets, you know, go and talk to people. Every, everybody's a stranger. Yes. Yeah, strangers are scary. And, you know, we hear horrible stories about things that happen to children, but it's, it's, it's still very rare. You know, and I, my heart yeah. goes out to anybody that's experienced that, and it's horrific. And I hope it doesn't happen to me. I hope it doesn't happen to my, my close friends or anything like that. But it's still very rare. And we are we're creating 
another risk, which is a, a whole culture, a whole society of people oh, yeah. that don't approach each other, that lose the art of communication, yeah. that that lose that conditioning, that lose that skill set. And that's why I say, you know, do you want them to be safe? Or Because if you want them to be safe, just leave them in the house, you know, and just feed them and yeah. let them get all of their development from online and they'll become sick because they won't get exposed to the outside and they'll become weak because they won't get any any forced application on their body. There'll be no adaptation that needs to take place because they never go anywhere uncomfortable. And where does yeah. that lead? You know, you, th there's a balance somewhere and I'm sure I'm probably a little bit too far in one direction. I appreciate that. But <laughs> I, would, I would rather, I'd rather they be ready for an opportunity or a threat um, rather than being so naive in this ever-evolving world of threats, and, and I, I say that both in the aspect of emergency services, but also just in life in general, there's some complex yeah. stuff going on out there that I don't know anything about, but unless I'm willing to go out there and know that, you know what, whatever it's going to be, I'm going to be strong enough, prepared enough physically, financially, emotionally to try and deal with it. Otherwise, you know what, the alternative is just stay inside, and that's not going to get anybody anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Where has a lot of this come from for yourself? You know, I wanted to ask you about books or, or, or documentaries or, or films or what are some of the books that you suggest people look at or is there any resources when you, when you think about anything you've read when you first started in your career or even if it's outside of the job, is there anything that's really helped you, a resource in your development that people go to? Yeah, absolutely lots. And just to, to start off with, I live 100 miles from my actual department, which I, I know that probably doesn't mean anything to you. It, it takes takes me <laughs> it takes me an hour and basically 40 minutes to get to work. So I'll, I'll apply that. And so anytime somebody hears that, the first thing they're going to say is, man, how do you do that? You know, does that, that get old? Well, you know, awesome on and on and on. Drive. I've never really felt that way. And I've, I kind of enjoy that drive, you know. You know, the past couple of years, I will I will say over and over again, I've been a huge area of growth for me in my life, not only at the fire service, but at home as well. And I will contribute a very, very high percentage of that growth to that drive because I've been able to grab a hold of completely wasted time and use it for growth. And, and by doing that, or by saying that, I mean, you know, with podcasts, with audible books and, and things like that, that I can listen to. And, and it has made a huge difference for me. It's not just wasted time that I'm listening to music. And, and some days, you know, I'll be in a mood to, to listen to some music and, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. But I, you know, I, we've got seven kids. We live on a small farm with animals seven. and we've got a lot going on. And so if I'm relying on coming home and doing some type of reading or, or something to, to help me grow, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So <laughs> There's I, no time. There's no time. I, no. And so I've been able to, to really kind of to grab a hold of that time and, and make it work for me. And so, but as far as books, and there, there's definitely two that I've listened to over the past couple months that have made a huge impact to me. And I'll start with the first one because the second one is, is the, the most recent and the most impact. But the first one is, it's your ship. And it's done by, I believe he's an admiral or he was an admiral, uh, Michael Abershoff. And basically it is a military version of what I want to do at my fire station. You know, he came into a battleship that was the worst ship in his fleet. It was absolutely trash. You know, the, he completely turned around and it became the best ship in the fleet. And, and that's exactly, I, I took so much from that that I can apply directly to the fire service. And so I really, really enjoyed that. And the number one that I've listened to it twice over the past couple of weeks, just because I'm actually wanting to go through it with my wife and, and one of my daughters, just because of some life situation we're going through right now that I feel like it can apply to, but leadership and self-deception. And that's by the Arbinger Institute. I, I will not promote any more books without bringing that one up because it is really kind of changed my thinking. And it's basically just a, a, a one minute summary. It, it goes into the kind of the lies, deception. We tell ourselves to kind of justify putting ourselves above others and, and kind of making others seem lesser than or their, their needs and wants and desires less important than mine because 
you know, I, I have a tendency to justify why mine are important. And I have a tendency to kind of create a, a fictitious image of this person being, you know, he, they mess up all the time or they aren't as good as me or, you know, whatever it is. I, I, people have a tendency to do that to others. And, and really it's just, it's a lie that we're telling ourselves to make ourselves feel better and make ourselves justified in kind of being selfish. And man, it's, it's awesome. So I, I definitely suggest that to anybody. Those are, those are two of, of my favorite here lately. Dude, that's a massive delivery. Firstly, thank you for sharing that. You know, thank you for sharing something quite personal there, but leadership and self-deception. I love that aspect of self self-deception that you speak about there falling in love with your own deceptions because you can lie to the rest of the world you know you can lie to people about your values about your beliefs and stuff like that but when you get in bed at night and you try and tell everybody you've tried your hardest or like you say when you the things you speak about with your children I always think that's such a great thing because when I hear parents speaking to their kids at the school gates when they drop them off from school or pick them up or whatever and people say you know try your hardest, do your best, you know, don't, don't do anything you don't want to do and, you know, believe in yourself. And then I, I, sometimes I feel like the kid has the right to turn around and go, are you doing that, dad? You know, are you, are you doing that? <laughs> you know, we, we, yeah. we've got to be careful not to be hypocrites and allow ourselves to, Yeah. a lot of the time we're just scared as well. You know, we're, we're scared, even as oh, grown ups, yeah. you know, we never stop being scared in that respect. And uh, we allow common sense or logic to mask what secretly is is just fear and we allow it to masquerade yeah. as common sense or logical thinking or something like that but i, I love that one yeah i think for anybody that, that i'll just add that maybe if people feel a bit intimidated because some of the books we're talking about there are a couple of hours long yeah ones i always try and get people started on are things like tim ferris has a couple of good books uh, one's called tools of titans and one's called tribe of mentors and they are effectively broken into a number of chapters where you can just digest one chapter at a time. And each chapter is with a, is um, a, st- a tribe of mentors, for example, is a series of people that he's spoken to over time. And it captures little lessons from every single person. So every five or six minutes yeah. or seven minutes, you're changing the subject matter a little bit. Were there any other habits that you've kind of developed in the last one to three years that you think have benefited you the most? I think the biggest one really is, I mean, it's just simple and straightforward, just being comfortable in the discomfort. You know, we, we've already hit on the, the comfort zone a lot and, and, but that's, it's really big to me and, and I'll contribute a lot of, of kind of what I've been able to be a part of and, and what I've kind of been just, just where I'm at right now to the fact that I've been able to push myself outside of that and be okay with being just uncomfortable. And, and so, you know, kind of part of that is when situations arise, you know, it's like public speaking for me. That's, that's a very, very easy way to describe this. I have literally been scared to death of public speaking my entire life. And that is no joke. And so, it's the you universal. Know, at the, it's globally the biggest fear, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. Well, fear. I guarantee you it was for me, yeah. More than but, that. But uh, towards, the, towards the end of uh, 2019, my friend and mentor that I already talked about, he, he kind of pitched the idea of, of giving a class together at a conference in 2020. And I was like, man, that's that seems a long way outside of my area, but he's willing to do it with me. And so... He he just knew how to draw me out. And so that kind of started a domino effect that, man, I really enjoy it. And I don't understand, I don't understand how that shift changed, but now, you know, I'm sitting here creating classes, like I talked about, hoping to kind of create a platform to where I can easily do these things. And, and we've made some changes in our family. We, we've kind of downsized some of the farms. So, that you know we're more able to to do some traveling and and so that's an easy way to kind of to transfer what my words are to to really my life it's mm. i was able to take that step of faith and and try it out and figured out that man i really enjoyed it and i wouldn't know that i wouldn't be doing any of that if i didn't push myself outside of that comfort zone and so just being able to to kind of look for opportunities to to get outside of my little circle and, and my little area has, has been huge for me to to really grow. And it's not just it's not just work. And and I like any anybody that's listened to anything that I I do or 
or podcast or whatever, I, I really enjoy the most the things that aren't just good to hear for work, but they're good to hear for life. If, if, if I can learn something, make me better at work and I can bring it home and be better at home. That's exactly what I want to spend time doing and, and learning. And so, you know, it, it's, I've, I've really had some things at home that I've had to, to change, you know, have had to be more assertive as a parent and, and more kind of more backing as a spouse. And so those are other things that, you know, that's just kind of outside of my comfort area as my personality goes, but they had to be done. Man. <laughs> you're blowing me there brother with you know just when you talk about being assertive at home you're right because so many people are they play a role sometimes when they're in their yeah. work and i always say to people you've got to work twice as hard as on yourself as, as you do on the job say that for me really really the only thing i can think of is to let myself know how crucial networking is and that's something i've really only learned the past probably year and a half i have enjoyed getting to know people outside of my department so much and that I've been inspired so much by, you know, people all over, all over America and now, you know, kind of spreading out over other countries and, and just like you just said, and exactly like you just said, I, I'm not alone. You know, I'm not the only one that works for a department that I get irritated with or that I get frustrated with yeah. or a, a crew member that I just can't, get over that hump to, to, to do better. I, I'm not the only one, if, no. but if I didn't do that, if I didn't network and I stuck myself in my, you know, my station and, and my department, the, the walls of my little department, I, I wouldn't know that. And I wouldn't feel the comfort and, and be inspired by these people because if you don't reach out and find that, you just don't know it's there. And so that's, that's something that I always try to, to share with others is, man, it is, it is a big, big fire service world out there. And, and you will never know that if you don't take that first step outside of your organization and kind of start to see that, you know, go to, go to classes and conferences and, and watch some YouTube videos, listen to some podcasts, you know, whatever it is, start kind of meeting these other people that need or want to help others, you know, they want to help others get over humps that they've already been over. They want to help others get better like they did. And they want you to kind of help them when they need it too. And it's just a huge, just, it, it's just amazing. I have been truly amazed at how humble, how genuine, how awesome these people are, you know, the big names in the fire service, little names in the fire. So it doesn't matter. You know, they're, yeah. they're just great people. And it's been such a blessing for me to start meeting people that I would have never, ever met in my life. If I didn't kind of start putting myself out there and, mm. and doing some things to, to gain that. I always say to people, when you start doing that, when you start going on that walk or you start trying to climb or push or grow in that way, it's not necessarily lonelier it's just less crowded there's just there's just less people. it doesn't mean it's lonely yeah um and yeah. you do find that your your circle just becomes different it doesn't it's not better or worse than anybody else's it just it just changes and i felt the value of association that i get from reaching out to, to people like yourself and and other people is that i get those connections and it, it does it, it makes you feel less lonely um, and it makes you feel yeah. like you're not crazy and you're not just like seeing something in the wrong way just because nobody else is seeing seeing what you're seeing at the minute. But you've had different experiences, you know what I mean? So when you have conversations oh, yeah. with, with all the people you have, it's going to change your perspective. Uh, it's going to change your optimism. I think, you'll go, hey, I can, oh, see, yeah. I can <laughs> see a different way of doing this, but nobody else has seen that. So you're looking at something on a totally different angle and it's the unknown. Oh, yeah. If they haven't had that conversation that you've had or they haven't had that moment of inspiration, then it's, it's to be fair to them. It's not surprising they don't feel as optimistic about it because they haven't seen it or they haven't had that conversation. They haven't had that insight that you've had. But it makes you feel like you're not wrong for having that insight. We all have a story. We all have things that need to be shared because it doesn't matter what you've dealt with. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you've kind of overcome or, or what it Whatever your story is, there is somebody out there that needs to hear it from you, that needs to hear that they are not alone in dealing with whatever because they now hear you 
have dealt with it. They need to hear that they're not the only ones that have had to fight this fight. They're not the only ones that have had to, you know, live through these struggles. There are people out there that are doing it and there are people out there that, that have done it and, and overcome them. And so everybody has a story and everybody should share that story. It's, it's almost like a life version of what we started this whole thing out with, you know, not sharing your experiences in the fire service. It's, but it's to the life level. It's, we need to be sharing our stories because there's, there's people out there that need to hear them. There's people out there that it will make a difference in their life just by hearing you tell, you know, a situation about your life. And so it's, it's kind of a big thing. And and so I, I like to kind of talk about that too. To me, kind of the, the best illustration for that is, you know, if you are the person that, that has that experience, that challenge that you've been or going through, if you keep it to yourself, if you don't share it with anybody or help anybody out with that story, you basically went through whatever that was for nothing. You, you literally went through that situation in your life that was probably the worst situation that you could ever imagine facing and battling and hopefully winning, but you went through it for nothing. You got no good. Out of it. If yeah. you share it, then, then you're getting a benefit. I wanted to ask you as we were doing so much reflection there, is there anything that uh, like a common piece of advice that you think people should ignore heading into the fire department or maybe in life in general? For the, li- for the fire department, service to me you know one you always hear or at least hear is it's not your emergency you know it, it, and it's it can be used in a variety of ways and and in a variety of, of kind of reasons but basically to me when i hear that it, it it's almost saying that i'm not really going to put any effort out because this isn't my emergency i'm i'm going to go do my job and, and get things done but i'm not going to really I'm not going to really do much extra. And so I've always hated that. I I wish that would kind of go away. I I feel like every emergency that we respond to, even though it might not seem like an emergency to us, most of the time it, it is probably one of the worst days of that person's life, you know? And so it's, it's easy to, and it kind of ties into a lot of other things we've talked about, but it's easy to kind of fall into that mindset of, oh, here we go again. We're lifting this person up for the third time today or whatever. Well, you know, and I know there, there are some situations where there are people that just push your buttons and there are people that abuse the system and I get it. And I'm not really talking about that, but control the controllable. You know, these people, kind of that you can't yeah, control these, these people call 911 because they need help. And, and then like you talked about earlier, you know, you, you're probably the bright moment of their day or week or month. And yeah. man, that, that should feel good. And, and that should feel like that, that should make you feel like, man, I, I don't only want to go solve their problem, but I want to do it even better. I want to be, even you know better at it than I was, and and handle it in a way that that it even has a better outcome, and and that's that's kind of one of the biggest for me. Where does this go from now? Because more people need to hear this, and I know you, you deliver courses and stuff like that. Where where do you see this heading? Honestly, I don't know, I, and I I hope that's good because you know I, I I would have never guessed you know a year ago that this is where I would be right now, and 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 with everything going on. I feel like I'm just hoping for, you know, the next opportunity and then the next one and the next one. And, and hopefully it's going to be something that, that I could take advantage of. I mean, I, I think very quickly, I will say that like I've already talked about, I, I hope to kind of get more into the, you know, the, the public speaking and, and kind of teaching some classes and, and different things like that, just because I feel like I have a lot that I can give to, to help people. And, and so I, I definitely hope that's part of my future. Uh, man, uh, you know, and, and anybody in the kind of the, the social media or podcasting or, or just a public speaker game, as much as I hate it, it it's, there's a lot to it. You, you have to put yourself out there. You have to, you know, get your name out there and you have to hustle in the, you know, the posts and, and 
all that. If you got a podcast, then you know it's it's a lot of work to kind of keep that going. And man, yeah, man I, it is. This, the first eight nine months that I was doing the podcast, I did like ninety nine episodes. The the next eight months that I'm basically at right now, I've done like ten. But in that time frame, you know, I started kind of the public speaking thing, and I started having to come up with some classes and and different things like that. And so I I can't just do it all. I like I already talked about with family and things like that. I don't have an infinite amount of time. And so every time I like to say, every time a door opened, I had to figure out what doors I was going to close because I can't keep them all open. Yeah. I, I had to kind of back off on the podcast a little bit and the posting on social media a little bit so that I could kind of keep my mind focused on creating some classes and, yeah. and keep my mind focused on the true priority of my family. And, I hope that I'm kind of at the start of this still. I hope there's a lot left and, and I feel like I'm, I'm here because there's a lot left. So I'm pretty confident in that. I, there's a lot set up for me. I just have to kind of figure out how to maneuver my way in the right direction, but it's, it's always going to have to be about balance because as soon as me and my mind start seeing all these great things that I want to be a part of, I start losing sight of the family. I start losing sight on, you know, being a better officer at work and, yeah. and a better, you know, husband and dad and at home. And so uh, it's a constant, I mean, literally a constant fight in, within myself of, of trying to stay balanced with, with everything going on. You've got to find your pace. You've got to find that sustainability and you've got to, you've got to bring people with you. You can't do everything. You've got to say no to stuff. I appreciate you being oh, yeah. here with us. I appreciate what you do. I thank you for, for coming and sharing that story with his brother. No problem. Jeremy, Anytime. this has been significantly better. <laughs> than, not saying that it wasn't going to be good, but it's been significantly better than I thought it was going to be. And that's down to the level of selflessness. And I don't know if like, if I'd have caught you two years ago, would it have been as good as this? I don't know. And I'm sure that maybe the, the person, the Jeremy that you'll become in the next two years will have even more of like an emotional intelligence ninja where you, you would just, <laughs> I, I look forward to, to maybe meeting you one day and, and being bowled over once again in person with how much you've shared with this mate. Thank you for that. Send my love, yeah, to, absolutely. send my love to the family. Send my love to to the team and everything like that. And I really appreciate your time today. Real quick before you go, if you got another minute, I just I want to say thank you again for this. But for me, the coolest thing with this is, you know, obviously it's very easy to see that tactics vary widely between where I'm from and where you're from. Yeah. But the great thing about this is we didn't talk about tactics because we didn't have to. Yeah. We're talking about life. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about mentoring and, and making each other better. And that has no boundaries. That has no national origin. Yeah. That is across the board. And that's what I love about this is, is I can meet somebody so far away like you and hopefully, you know, some listeners that, that might have never heard me and share things that they haven't heard. And so that's awesome. It's, it's an awesome opportunity. I truly I thank you very, very much and look forward to continuing conversations behind the scenes with you because I feel like we, we've got a lot to we have. talk right. about. Thank you so much for that. I will speak Absolutely. To you soon. We'll see you, bud. Thank you. Jeremy Sanders, Crew First Culture. That's Crew First or the one, remember? Crew First Culture. What an incredible guy. He's so honest. He just went everywhere. He took us on such an amazing journey around his own life and his personal development. And it really says so much. You know, we spoke about it on the podcast before about how the best thing about the job is the people. It's the people that make the job. It's not the job that makes the people. The badge, the uniform, the whatever. It's just a it's just a filter. It's just something we put over the incredible people that are part of the emergency services and Jeremy has just delivered that in an absolute jab, jab, right hook, knockout, blows. Maybe I'm God, I've just got a subconscious bias, I know, but I sincerely hope you've took some benefit from it as well. I know you will have. Wherever you're listening all over the world, you know, this is all about sharing it. So leave us now. Go have a look. Jump in the notes below. Go over to Crew First Culture. Have a look at the website. Go in the articles. You'll see some of the stuff we spoke about. Look on the courses. You know, there's so many different things you can learn from getting that different perspective of similar challenges, but in a different place, a different world, a different community. I'll see you soon. Back here at the Firefighters Podcast. Take care, guys. <laughs>